Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 628. Welcome to Raging Bullets. I'm Sean Whalen, Dr. Norge, and I'm joined as always by my co-host Jim, the sensei of the whatnot, the duke of you know, the sultan of strategery, the indestructible bridge defying, is hoping he is more Brock Kensington than the Minute Man. So says the Yelzer statesman of the podcast, Segulin. How's it going, eh? Jim, on this episode, we're going to talk Justice League 70. We're also going to talk One Star Squadron issue number two. We have a special Speeding Bullets segment where we talk about the recently released article from Entertainment Weekly, where it focuses on the events that are going to be coming up in Justice League number 75. So if you don't want any of that spoiled, uh, you may want to skip that segment. We have that uh, cordoned off in the show notes. We are sponsored, as always, by DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Jim, what is going on over at DCBService.com? Yeah, well, we got this really cool uh, Phantom Stranger Omnibus hardcover. 50% off, only sixty two fifty, And we've got uh, War for Earth 3, issues number 1 and 2. Both of them are 40% off, four nineteen. Thank you, DCBS. Over at InStockTrades.com, they always have great deals of the week, and I'm shocked, actually, by some of the prices. They have the Amazing World of Superman tabloid edition. These are these huge, oversized tabloid editions. This is $19.99 regularly, 65% off, only $6.99. $7 for this tabloid you know, re-release. It's amazing. Batman White Knight presents Harley Quinn hardcover, twenty four ninety nine regularly, forty two percent off, only fourteen forty nine. Batman hardcover book twelve, City of Bane part one, twenty four ninety nine regularly, sixty five percent off, only eight seventy four. They're amazing deals. Please go check out the deals of the week. I want to thank DCB Service and InStockTrades dot com for continuing to support our show, Mister Segulin. What kind of a podcast are we? Raging Bullets is a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth into plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we're discussing on today's show. So, if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. Let's talk some comics. Through the magic alchemy of nature's most awesome sources of energy, Ray Palmer, atomic physicist, becomes the Atom... So, Jim, there's some big news that came out this week. There was an Entertainment Weekly article that was published, and i got to thank Jared on our website for, for posting it on the uh, Facebook group, because that's where I caught it. So, Justice League number 75, and, and for anybody that doesn't want to know any kind of clues of what's happening in Justice League number 75, we've got timestamps here. Skip this segment and jump on to our next conversation. That being said, for the rest of us that want to actually talk about this, Superman 75, you know, the, the I'm sorry, the classic issue, uh, Death of Superman issue of um, Superman number 75 was a giant build to that. We knew Death of Superman was coming. There was this big event that was coming. Now we've got the Death of Justice League that's going to be coming in. And they say that, I mean, Joshua Williamson's writing it. They've been building to this. Justice League number 75 is going to be the big one where only one's returning to tell the story of the death of the rest, whoever the team is at that time. And it looks like it's going to be at least some variation or some close approximation of our current team, if it's not our current team. Wow. Dude, they had, they had Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman all on it. They had the big three. John, yep. uh, John Stewart. I was like, what the heck? There's a lot of people out there who are in books right now that you know, any one of them needs to come back for their book to survive. So I'm like, what's going to happen here? I'm like, this this one had me, you know, when I saw the title, I figured, oh, okay, they're going to kill off a member. Yeah. No, there. it's only one is returning. And I'm like, wow, that that's huge. <laughs> Aquaman, Black Adam. I mean, uh, you know, big characters who have films coming up. You know, I mean, it's interesting when you start talking about that. Batman, Aquaman, Black Adam. All have films coming, and, and I don't say that lightly, because um, you know Wonder Woman's film, the third one, is in production. We're not going to be seeing that for at least a couple of years now, so we've got some things behind the scenes with them. And I, I, it's crazy that I'm referencing film that way, but you figure as you're getting ramped up to a film release, 
you're not usually going to then go and kill the character that's in the yeah. film. Uh, as with anything with these stories, am I worried that this means we're losing these characters permanently? No. Um, I wasn't worried about that with Death of Superman. But boy, at the time, even though you knew some way they're going to bring some Superman on some level back, it was an intense story, and Superman was gone for a long time. When you think about Funeral for a Friend, um, did you read Death of Superman as it was coming out, or was that something that you read after the fact? No, that one I was I read as it came out. That was huge. Cause, you know, again, and I didn't even read the... The, pre, the lead up to it, when mm-hmm. the death of Superman started, because of all the hype, yeah. you know, I went. I'm like, I got, I have to get this, and I read the death of Superman and read the uh, the aftermath and all that stuff, and you know, I was one it 100 pulled me into uh, reading comics, you know, at that time. The impact on the world, though, in the way they wrote that story, what you never know with those type, of, how long are they going to do it for? Yeah, I mean, look how long Alfred's been gone, for example. Now, you know, do I think they're going to bring Alfred back into the comics someday? Yeah. Um, but, I mean, he's gone now for a long time. I mean, decent amount of, in comics world, this is a huge amount of time. Yeah. And the impact has been felt. The death of the Justice League is bold. And I'm glad it was in Entertainment Weekly. I'm hoping this story's getting traction only because of the fact that what you're talking about right here this type of thing draws people in. People want to see it. They want to grab it. They might think the issue's going to... I'm hoping they think the issue's going to be worth something. I know it's kind of a strange thing to say, but that draws people to grab copies of it, which is good for the industry. Uh, anything that's drawing people into comic shops uh, at this time in particular is a good thing, and I hope it does that. Uh, I, I want to see as much as I want to see digital readership of this i want to see people buying the physical (laughs) issues for this one because i think that's good for the comic industry joshua williamson writing it how does your how does that impact your faith and confidence in this story because this has been building this is something that he's been planting the seeds of since uh, infinite frontier and now we're going to see this this i didn't see it coming i didn't see it going where it's going uh but we're this is a big big story happening here how does that confidence wise make you feel about this story oh big time confidence because he's he he knows what he's doing and again it's one of those things where when you have a creative team on on something that you know it's not just a you can tell this isn't just some ah let's kill off of the justice league yeah. this is something that they've been planning something they've been going on plus we got a writer that whose style i like so I've liked his stories. He's one of those people that are on my list of people that if I see his name on a project, I will pick up that project just because I see his name. And that's something I think that, you know, it, it, well, again, it, it's calmed me down, but also it gets me with thinking because, yes, it's death of the Justice League. And they keep saying only one will come back. Mm-hmm. But does that mean they actually die, die? What it could mean is it could mean that they are in some other place. They're going, they're leaving Earth to fight, you know, from the news article, it said they're fighting some dark army at the edge of the multiverse and whatnot. So it's, they're physically leaving Earth. Only right. one comes back. Maybe they aren't actually dead dead and they're trapped. Mm. But you know, everyone, but everyone thinks they're dead because of the situation. Everyone thinks they're dead. It, exactly. Yeah. You know, so they could sit very easily keep these character titles going or, you know, because, again, it's you look at and, and you, know, you talk about movies, you know, that stuff. But also there is ongoing titles. You know, we need to have, you know, well, we've got John Kent for Superman. So Clark technically could go away. But in Wonder Woman, they're doing a great job with the Amazons and just the, the whole universe. So they could, you know, pull it in. But we did just kill off Wonder Woman. Yeah. So I'm like, doing that again would be another thing. And same thing with the Bat. You got the Bat family. You've got Jace as, you know, I am Batman. You got another Batman out there. So you could very easily, you know, keep the Bat family alive but kill, by killing off Bruce. But will you, you know, it's like, do you really want to go that route? Or do you want Bruce to be the one to come back? Well, um, why don't we do this? So the the team that's going to be there, at least from the article, is Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, John Stewart, Martian Manhunter, Hawk Girl, Aquaman, Green Arrow, 
Black Canary, and Zatanna. Interesting team uh, that's going to be there. So Naomi's not a part of this mission. Because that was my first thought when I was thinking about this initially as well. They'll probably have Naomi come back. you know. And then I'm like, well, she's not there. Black Adam's not there. Um, so it's interesting as you look at the cover... We see Black Adam on the, the Entertainment Weekly cover, but that doesn't it doesn't look like that's the team that's going to this. It's the Justice League versus the Dark Ar- Army in a dead multiverse. So if this is, in fact, the team, that's a lot of heavy hitters that are there. Out of that batch, if that is, in fact, who the team is going to be, who do you think's come back? There's one. There can be yeah, only oh, one. There can be only one. And... <laughs> Yeah, part of me, part of me is thinking, you know, the bat. I am too, but I don't know because you know you're looking at it. Obviously, Clark will sacrifice himself to save the team, right? You know, and same thing with Diana, and but so would Bruce as well. Sure, but Bruce could be the one. Bruce is your strategist. You know, he's your, you know, he's got the strategy. So, is he going to have the game plan and he's going to be laying it out? And yeah, you know, I, I don't know. It's one of the, you know, the other thing I'm, I'm wondering is Zatanna makes it back. Completely shock everybody. I think sure. that would be the big surprise if Zatanna is the one who makes it back. Well, and they, they show a picture of like these coffins, and you see Superman's, yeah. Batman's, Wonder Woman's, Green Lantern's, and Aquaman's. So, you know, it, it can be a complete swerve as far as yeah. who it is. Because that's, well, that's a variant cover of Justice League number 75. And, and the, uh, one coffin, the one coffin's forward. The Superman one. Yeah. You know, yeah. So it, could that be an indicator he's the one who comes back? Or is that an indicator of he yeah. doesn't come back? I don't know. It's you know, it, it's kind of like uh, Beatles Abbey Road. You know, yeah. where break, everyone's breaking down the cover, the, the album cover, saying, oh, see, that's the Undertaker, the album, thing like that. And, you know, I, I don't know. It's I think they do with the uh, title, with the, the when they release these image, these cover images, they do it intentionally to get us. To mislead us, I think it's. I think they're having fun with the the fans on that one. Right, right. So I think any one of those coffins is potentially the person who comes back. Is my guess. Yeah, they're doing. A, they're doing a really, really. They're doing a really, really good job with yeah. this. Um, it's exciting. Uh, I hope this continues to generate casual buzz. Uh, it's um, that's something that's pretty critical with this. I'm already in on the story, so at this point, it's kind of like what you said before. Like, what do you need to do to sell me at this? Is this a stunt? Yes, <laughs> but yeah. why is that? We've gotten to the point right now where sometimes I'll read, you know, like some negativity about the fact that it's just cheap stunt and that type of thing. That's welcome to comics. <laughs> I mean, that's always been the case. I mean, if you go back to the premise of cliffhangers at the end of issues. Those are stunts. The idea is to draw you in, to keep you coming back, to have you dangling, a carrot dangling that's going to make you go, oh, I want to read that. I want to know what's happening there. So, yes, it's a stunt, and in this case, it's an intriguing stunt. I didn't see this coming. See, and that's the thing. with When you talk about it, is it a stunt? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I say, is it a cheap stunt, or yes. is it an actual just a storyline stunt? And cheap stunts are the ones I don't like. You know, killing somebody off just to kill them off, just for a pop, ah, you know, give me a story behind that. That's where you look at creative team on this. We got a creative on, we got, you know, we got a writer on here who isn't going to go for the cheap pop, isn't going to go for a cheap stunt. This is an actual story that will have ramifications. I think, you know, it's, again, it's all based on the creator. If there was some person who I never heard of before or never read any of their stuff before i would be nervous but you look at the body of work you're like okay this is a good writer this is somebody who's got a story to be told let's see what happens and let's see what the ramifications are afterwards because they flat out said there's going to be no justice league after this this is going to dramatically change the landscape so i want to see how the landscape changes because as i said before you know, all of the different, you know, the different people who are represented there have somebody who can take up the mantle. Yeah. Aquaman, they've got the whole, uh, the becoming storyline. All of the Amazons right now, they're really building up towards, you know, with a change in the Amazons, especially with this whole war of Amazons coming as well. Mm-hmm. So the Amazon mark, you know, landscape, the Bat family is the Bat family. You know, they can very easily pick up the reins if Bruce is gone. Green Lantern Corner, same kind of deal. 
You know, they can pick up the reins, you know, with losing John Stewart. So there's so many different things they can do with these different titles that, you know, will make, you know, will still get the stories. It will just be dramatically different. And that's what I'm looking forward to seeing where the dramatic changes are. And again, we say death of, you know, killing the Justice League and all that stuff, but it could simply, I honestly really do think we're going to get a trapped in the dark dimension or trapped in a multiverse or something else other than dead dead. You know, and I think that's how the, the story for those characters will continue in that dark realm. But that's my that's my guess. Who knows? I could be a hundred percent wrong, and we could end up seeing you know all we, it could be a it could be you know a high body count. I don't know, and I think that for me is part of my excitement behind this. You know, because you know going into Death of Superman, they talked we are killing off Superman flat out. And that was the thing that caught my attention, all because I wasn't reading DC at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, Death of Superman brought me into reading DC. I started, re- you know, I was borrowing some books from my buddy, uh, you know, Joe over in, uh, in BG, and I picked up Death of Superman. Started picking up all the other stuff that followed the Return, and that that really was my relaunch into reading Superman. Was the Death of Superman? So. And going into that, we knew he was going to die. That still didn't take away from just the drama and just this, the holy crud. I, dude, I still remember reading that final page, seeing that final page when he spread out in Lois Lane's arms. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, how the caption, you know, and it, it, yeah, and I, can, I can't quote it word for word anymore, but think about how long ago it's been. It's how they went through and like. They've, some have lost a family, so, and they show Jonathan Martha Kent. Some have lost their their friends and this and that. But the world has lost a Superman, and they had that final cover, that final image of Lois holding, you know, crying, holding low, holding holding Clark in her hands. And just that power of that that moment. I still remember reading that to the point where I was like, "This is unbelievable! This is awesome! I want to see what happens next." You know, same kind of deal can happen with this Justice League. We could have one of those, oh, my God, kind of moments. And we've got the right people in charge of this project that yeah. I'm looking forward to what they do. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. And I think one of the things that's key there is whether it's a cheap stunt or not, as you mentioned, it's going to really be determined by the story that's told. And we won't really know that until we read the story and read the follow-up to the story and where this goes and, and what this event, what is leading to. What, you know, what are they building towards with this? And I, I think we're going to see that. And I think it's going to be a chance to spotlight some new characters. I think one of the things that... Um, I, I There's characters that I'd love to see that... Like Justice Society, right? We've had that teased for a while. Does, is this going to lead to a reason for the Justice Society? Um, I'm wondering where that went to, because that was that was supposed to be a thing that was coming, and I hope we eventually get that. I don't know how quickly that's going to be, though, as the world scrambles to deal with the aftermath of this. It's going to be very, very interesting to see what ultimately this is building towards. Uh, well, are we going to get a reveal right away as far as the fate of the Justice League? To your point, if they aren't really quote-unquote dead... Just everyone thinks they are. Uh, or is this something where it's going to be more Death of Superman, where we don't really know what's going on here with them, um, if they're really dead, if they're going to come back, all those pieces, until much later, based on another story or, or where this is ultimately building. And I don't have a preference either way on that. Uh, it was interesting how it was done, for example, with the death of Batman in Final Crisis. We knew pretty quickly what was going yeah. on there, uh, which was interesting. I mean, you know, there was mi- a mystery for us to to engage in after that. Uh, whereas, um, you know, the, the back to Death of Superman, that was a year. <laughs> yeah. And, and, a, and led to a return of Superman storyline that was, it l- made you question if multiple people were Superman. And in reality, the answer wasn't very simple. And I loved the way that that played out. So I'm I'm anxious to see where this goes. Uh, in right now, I trust Joshua Williamson. I it was an interesting story to process. And I, again, I appreciate Jared posting this on our Facebook group, so we had a chance to 
talk about this today because that when I saw that article, I, I sent it to you right away and said, "Hey, we need to discuss." We need to talk to us, yeah, yeah, because it's an this is big. I mean, it's an interesting story. I hope it does what any stunt's supposed to do. It draws people in, gets people talking. DC's been doing some things recently that have gotten media attention. I think it's great for comics. Anything that's getting people talking about comics is a good thing to me. If this gets people talking about comics, great. I hope besides this, we see Marvel doing stuff to get people talking about comics. Uh, I want to see the con and other companies. I, I'm not, you know, limiting it to the the big two. I, honestly, any discussion around this medium, it makes me smile because it's just going to draw people in, and hopefully, you'll get some people that'll pick up other stuff. You're going to get people that are lapsed readers that are going to come back and check this out. That's a good thing. Because uh, they'll come back and you know, per, pick up two, three, four titles because of the fact that they got this. And we all know what happens if you've been a fan. Yep. <laughs> you know, and you we've we've all had periods where we've had to step away, right? And um, this type of thing will draw you back. I'm excited. I, I think it's great. And wait, wait. We're talking about Justice League today. We aren't far off from this. Because yeah. <laughs> what, we're issue 70, I think we're talking about today? Yeah. Is, am I right? So yeah, this is in five issues. <laughs> <laughs> so this is right down the road for us. So uh, very interesting to see where this is going. And you can actually start seeing the buildings of this. One other piece I want to talk about, Bendis. So Bendis now, what is he got? Is he still going to be writing something for DC? I sincerely hope so. Uh, I know. He's, he's really good. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been enjoying his work, so I'm hoping this isn't it for him at DC. I'm hoping that there's something else coming down the pipe for him. Uh, I'm I'm liking DC's current slate of writers a great deal. I, I would love to see Bendis doing something else with DC. I, I, I don't know you know what this means down the road. It's We're in an interesting time where we're seeing a lot of creators uh, do uh, a lot of creator-owned work elsewhere. Uh, Comicsology Originals, for example, is where we're seeing a lot of Scott Snyder. We're seeing him in Image, create our own work. So it's interesting to see creators that are branching out in that end. And I'm glad that people are following their names to other projects. I think that's a good thing for the industry. So we'll see where, where things are going. But it's it's going to be an interesting 20. Buckle up. 2022 is just getting started. And in January, we're talking about killing the Justice League. Yep. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see where it goes. Look at those strange little beetles. They look great neutron. Our first discussion this episode is going to be Justice League number 70. Written by Brian Michael Bendis. Pencils by Phil Hester. Inks by Eric Gepster. Colors by Romulo Fajarado Jr. Apologies for name butchery there. Letters by Josh Reed. Cover by Yannick Pequet and Nathan Fairbairn. Variant cover by Alexander Lozano. And associate editor is Chris Rosso. Editor is Mike Cotton. Superman created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster by special arrangement with the Jerry Siegel family. And apologies again for any name butchery because this is a creative team right now that's really delivering a, a cool story. Um, we've got uh, Mark Shaw back from, uh, he's in, involved in this. We've got the Royal Flush Gang, um, Leviathan. We've got Checkmate. We've got lots of reveals about Ali <laughs> funding two different teams and being a part of two different teams and keeping that secret from both in certain ways. Uh, it, it's an interesting sort of dynamic right now. Ali getting himself into some trouble again. I'm surprise, really surprised. I know. <laughs> I'm, as we're counting down to Justice League number 75, I'm really enjoying this team. I'm enjoying this book. This has been a must-read Justice League run for me. And we'll we'll talk about Justice League Dark when we get to it, but the main story in the front with the Justice League has been a major, major draw for me. I like this team. I like characters like Hippolyta being on it, Black Adam being on it, Naomi being on it. Uh, they're adding a whole little piece because I'm de the Naomi show is a winner for me. I'm that's that's must watch. I'm watching that like real time as it's being released because I'm really digging it. That and Peacemaker and Star Girl are my jam right now, and and Lois and Clark and I'm, I'm real. I'm back into all the shows. I'm I'm really enjoying right now the content that's being put out. These characters are becoming really important to me. Naomi's a big one that I'm 
because I'm enjoying her so much outside of comics, I'm really keeping an eye on her inside of comics. What are you? What are your feelings on this run? How have you been digging it? Where are you at with this particular story and the use of Royal Flush Gang in particular in this story? Well, dude, come on, I'm dig- I'm really digging this, and it, that's why when the when the uh, the announcement for issue seventy five came down the pipeline, I was like, what? <laughs> you know, so that completely you know, was one of those. What's going on here? Huh? You know, and but you're mentioning the Royal Flush Gang. I am so glad we are getting. The uh, a Royal Flesh Gang that's not a bunch of stooges. Yep. This is an actual well oiled team. And I like the fact that they're thieves. That's what they are. They're not, they're about the big score. They're not Lex Luthor wanting to conquer the world. They're not this Joker wanting to burn it to the ground. They simply are thieves. That's who they are. That's what they want. And some of the cool stuff that you get with the Flash Rogues, where you know, they're, they're, it's just the job. They got to do the job, you know, and they've got the rogue code and this and that. You know, you've got that kind of, you know, really cool vibe with the Royal Flush Gang. And those are words I never thought I would say in a single, in a, you know, in the same sentence. Really <laughs> cool vibe in Royal Flush Gang. Never saw that. All the previous dealings I've ever read on them, they were kind of like the, you know, they, they, they were the joke. They were the team that you put on a book in case you want you want to have somebody for the bat for the heroes to beat up. You know, ah, I'll throw the Royal Flush Gang out. No, this is actually showing them as a legit team. And I like that. I was I was kind of that's when I was like, man, this is neat. This is a cool usage of this team. Mark Shaw plays into that too, which I really enjoy, because he's basically saying, you know, you should be known for the big score you should be you know he plays and manipulates and i love villains that do that where they go off of what is clearly going to be the pet peeve they pull off the score of the century though they stole the fortress of solitude (laughs) i mean talk about a thing here's the thing right now no matter what happens right now they are always going to be the villains that stole the fortress of solitude nobody's ever done that before It, it as a reader that's cool because you're sitting there going, this is brilliant because it really does put them on the map <laughs> in, a, in a way that's and, 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 very different. And, and I like the fact that their plan is steal the fortress and then return it. Yep. You know, not only did they not only did they take it, but they're like, eh, we don't need the fortress. Boom. We just need blank. And whatever they're taking from the fortress is what they're taking. And I love that, how that's the plan. It's not to steal the fortress, you know, a and to hold on to it and hide it somewhere. It's, we just need something from the fortress. That's all we're taking. And I, I like that. I think that's kind of a neat, you know, um, you, again, it's it shows the big score. It yeah. shows more of, you know, this is a thief after specific stuff, after the, the legend step, as, as they're saying. And I'm like, man, this is cool. Yeah, this is exactly the kind of thing I like to read when they, when they do stuff like this. You take established villains, you don't ignore their past history. You don't ignore what your impression was of them, right? But you build on it and say, this isn't the whole story. What you really don't see is this. Um, They're made to look incompetent because of their encounters with heroes, not because they actually are. They're capable of telling or doing the big score. They're capable of being on the map and driven to do that. It's also a a gang that has evolved over the years where it's not necessarily the same members that are in there before. People have taken on the role of Ace, of the King, of the Jack, you know, I mean, things like that. Uh, I like that the team evolves over time, and we're, we're getting to see this. Uh, there's some really cool character dynamic moments between Black Adam and Superman here. Because on paper, when you look at those two on the team, you're like, well, you have the same archetype. Not really. Because yep. of Black Adam's magic powers, there is a... Re- and, and Superman's Kryptonian powers... They're, yes, they're two powerhouses to have on the team with very similar power sets. But when you see these two have a meeting of the minds and Superman's negotiating with him, you know, basically saying, you know, we're on the same team, he is on the team, but. (laughs) (laughs) And I like those moments where we remember that he's on the team, but he holds back knowledge. He holds back information. And yet he clearly respects Superman. And you see the meeting between Superman, him, and Hippolyta, where he is sharing his knowledge. He's sharing the knowledge that comes from his powers, the wisdom of Zahudi. I'm giving you some of that for free. You know, it's, uh, you know, saying, hey, I'm giving you information for free. 
It's an interesting sort of character dynamic, and that's really what I've loved about this book and the choice of characters has been this mixed it up a bit. You've got heavy hitters, you've got big players, you've got traditional Justice League characters on this team intermixed with these other characters that have really mixed up the dynamic. I'm We've only got four more issues of this. I'm excited for those four issues because Bendis' run ends at 74. And I'm sad to see Bendis going. Mirroring this, we've also got a, a miniseries going on that Bendis is writing, Justice League uh, versus Legion of Superheroes, or Legion of Superheroes versus Justice League. I could be misquoting the actual title of it. Uh, but I'm really enjoying that. It's Justice League versus the Legion of Superheroes. I was right the first time. Um, that's also written by Bendis. If you're enjoying this run, do not miss that miniseries because it is... It's it's clearly happening during this run, and there's a big story that's being told there as well with those characters. I'm not going to spoil right now. I'm, I'm hoping somewhere you and I are going to be able to talk about that series more in depth, uh, just because it's a great mini right now. One issue's out, and if you're if you missed it, grab it. It's it's a cool cool kickoff so far to the mini series. See, I didn't know. The I, th- I was I thought we only had one more issue of Bendis, and then it starts to lead into seventy five. So seventy five is just a standalone ep- is- issue. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, big big things happen. Well, here's what we don't know: is Bendis's run? Are these next four issues leading to it? Right. This could be the build up to it. Yeah. So here's the thing: there's something that happens at the end of this issue that I mean. That could be the start of, you know, that could be the start of the next run. Right, right. That's the problem when you've got villains who they they don't understand. They know that they've taken a fortress that has a Phantom Zone projector, has a Baby Sun Eater, has a, you know, a Giant Steel Diary, Legion Flight Ring, Red Sun Chamber. You know, I'm geeking out at that. The Titanic, um, Kryptonian <laughs> <Really? laughs> Battle Suit Armory, Alien Zoos. You know, and and yada da yada and keep going more and more. Uh, they've got power crystals. They've got all these other things that they've taken. They have captured this, and their intention is for this to be a distraction. The big problem is going to be with what they open up. They open up gateways to like every gateway, every dimensional gateway that's in that place. This is setting up real problems for the Justice League. We don't even understand exactly what they've opened up, like the depths of what they've opened up yet. And that's a really cool part of the storyline, is not only do they not understand, we as the readers do not understand other than Batman's reaction. Yeah. Well, and I'll tell you, one of the things I I really especially liked about this was, as you mentioned before, we had those great, you know, Black Adam and Superman moments. And again, it, it was just, it was a really neat conversation and really cool dialogue between the two of them. You know, and we've started. We've seen that layout earlier before Black Adam even joined the team, where Clark is looking at him, saying, "There's something different about this guy," and that's part of the reason why he's on the Justice League is because Clark saw something different in him, trying to help people. Yeah. And those that was a cool thing, but also I love the fact again that we've got multiple multiple pages on pages of you know the Royal Flesh Gang. Breaking down everything they did, breaking down why they did it, talking about having the interaction with Mark Shaw, having the after the math, the you know the aftermath of that, them you know basically telling him to you know the pound salt, and then laying out of this plan, yeah. you know. And I love the fact that they're talking about how do you deal with somebody with superhuman hearing? How do you deal with you know you know someone like Batman? How do you deal with that? It's misdirection, you know. And I love the fact that this was always about that. And even as the story is laying out, they're showing this is the, you know, what we did this, we did that, we did that. But I love the fact that, again, they put so much time, so many page count towards the Royal Flesh Gang. They're giving us a good, solid villain story in the Justice League title. And I'm like, you need to do that sometimes. And this was a great usage of it. Yeah, you need to remind us that this is uh, – for, and I also like that it's a Justice League epic. This is going to con- go over multiple issues. At this point, I'm, if, if it's not, I'm going to be in shock if it's not going to wind up wrapping up the series, you know, where it goes the next four issues leading to 75. I don't know that this is necessarily going to be the story. You know, I mean, it's easy to assume that this may kick off the story in 75, but it may not. 
And that's okay, too. I'm just glad that this is going to be a conclusion. The conclusion that this run deserves is an epic story. So I'm glad that at least in this next four issues, we're going to get a satisfying conclusion to what I think has been just a stellar run. Is there any uh, anything you're hoping for out of this run? Anything you'd like to see out of this run in the next four issues before we wrap up with 75? Oof. Oof. Oh, well, again, I'd like to see... Um, I, well... I don't know, man, because it's like I'm sitting there going, I'm thinking like because at the end there, the portals are all, all those portals are being open mm-hmm. you know, to the point where there's an alarm firing. And I'm thinking that's going to is what's going to lead to it. So the next four issues, the Justice League is going to have their hands full. Right. You know, and we have some characters that we know aren't going to be in issue uh, 75. You know, I wonder what's going to happen to them. You know, they're saying there's going to, after 75, there's not going to be a Justice League around for a little while. But does that mean they're, all of the characters are going to go? Hippolyta specifically, Naomi specifically. What is going to happen to those two characters? You yeah. know, what's going to happen to, you know, it's, yeah. There is so much, you know, that can happen in these next four issues that I'm like, dang, this is like, I'm, it's, there is a huge anticipation going on right now. What does it mean for characters like Nubia? Yeah. How does Black Adam react, you know, if he's not a part of it? Well, here's what we don't know. We know certain characters that go on that mission. What we don't know is, I don't know that the members of this team that we're referencing aren't going to appear in that issue. We just, at least from what we're seeing right now, those characters don't go on the mission. Uh, It's going to be very interesting. I'm sure this is going to have a really nice flow. This has been well planned. So I'm sure from 74 to 75, however this is going, there's going to be a nice flow from this. Um, Whether Bendis is putting the exclamation point on his run because that was what they intended for him to do, or if he's going to lead into this story in 75, he's a master writer. He is going to do whatever is needed and what's best for the story and, and for the fans. So we're going to either see a, com- a conclusion, and I'm actually fine with if 74 is an exclamation point to his run and that opens up the gateway for 75 to be this new one-shot story uh, that is leading to you know where things go, great. Um, if this is building towards it, that's cool too. I, I don't really have a preference there. I just want a satisfying, as a reader, I want a satisfying read. In oh, this. definitely. Yeah. And again, and again, it's within this creative team. Yeah, within this creative team and the next creative team, 100 percent confidence. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, again, it's it's not like I'm doing. It's not like Jim's taking over their writing. So you, you got somebody who knows what's doing, what they're doing. You got somebody who's on a book who knows what they're doing. So when you got talented people working, you you know, sometimes you sit back and just say, okay, let's ha- let's hang out. What's happened? What's going to happen here? And you sit back and enjoy it. And again, it's one of the things that again that I really enjoyed in this issue was. The Superman Ace fight. <laughs> Superman did the rope on him. He's letting Ace pommel him just to try to, you know, they knew the big giant key was bait. And he flew in anyways. They kept the Justice League back because if the Justice League came in, then they would have scattered. So this is a better chance for them to get there. And as Ace is communicating with them, Superman's hearing them. And I even love the fact that he, he, he lets them know, you probably should listen to the Queen. You know, you probably should have run. Like, super hearing, dang it. <laughs> you know? And he's talking to the Queen, telling her, hey, I hear you. You can hear me. Let's, you know, and he, again, Clark being Clark, he's not just, you know, again, he's intelligent. This He's trying to be as peaceful as he can. But also, there is so much more dangerous stuff in the fortress that he doesn't want that to get released into yeah. the world. I love this again, little stuff like that with Clark. You know, with a writer who knows what they're doing and you know really has a good handle on who he is and what he's about. You know, you get little moments like that. He pick up. He picked up and swung that giant key at him. That was such a cool moment. You knew it was coming. It's, you can telegraph stuff like that and deliver it. Uh, I, I here's one of the things I love about Bendis' writing. And, and the and Phil Hester on this one on the art, uh, but that was a geek moment, and I loved it. <laughs> it was so totally done as fan service. And there's yeah. times where you got to do that, and he just uh, Superman's whole presentation of that, where it's like, well, I did ask nicely. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> wow, <Yep. laughs> that was great. <laughs> I loved that moment. It was very very well put, well put together. 
I, you're right about that being a rope a dope fight and things like that, and then then leading to the Justice League getting involved in that whole situation where the distraction did what it was intended to do, and that's the piece that Batman was warning. It was like, okay, sometimes you get what you wanted, meaning you know Royal Flush Gang, but is it really what you want? Because these Jack's realizing portal doors. No, he's realizing we've done something here that we didn't intend. They're doing what they set out to do. Yeah. But in that process, they're in over their heads. They're messing with things that they don't understand. That is something that really comes to a head in this. And I really, really enjoyed it. It's actually, it for as much as we say that they're these master thieves and all that, this does show that they're, that they're also the adults that they're saying out to be sometimes, too. Because they're the patsies in this. Yeah, they got played. You yes. know, I like how he's, they're talking about my guy says the Kryptonian uh, crystal technology is so advanced, it's actually simple simple to use. It's just portal doors, right? Oh, you know, so whoever fed them the intel on the fortress, just like before, when they're throwing out, when they're showing their planning, they had a map, a diagram of the fortress. So yeah, the, over here's this, over here's this, over here's that. You know, so they've got an inside guy who gave them information. So whoever that inside guy is, that person, big time, is the one who set it up. That's what I want to know. Mm-hmm. Who is the person that set up the Royal Flush Gang to pull this off? You know, that is, could be, like, that's the true big bad in this. I agree. And that's something that's really unique and interesting is being able to see that we've got a story like that building. So besides that, in the back, we've got the co-feature with Justice League Dark. Uh, Ram V is the writer. Sumit Kumar on pencils. Jose Mar- Marzan Jr. on inks. Ramulo Fajarado Jr. on colors. Rob Lay Letters. Julian Grant, assistant editor, Brittany Holzer, editor, Mike Cotton, senior editor. And apologies for name butchery there, because talk about a series that I've really been enjoying. Ram V is a writer, and taking on this Justice League Dark story has just done a great job. The nice part about this is it feels like a Justice League supernatural story, which is what it's intended to feel, but it feels very different than what's going on in the main book. It doesn't feel like this light heart, light story that was tossed into the back that doesn't have depth to it. It's doing what my favorite co-features are doing right now in that they're, it's, it's a really rich story and creepy. This is really creepy. What's going on with Zatanna and, and the visual styling of it, this is what I want to see from a Justice League Dark story. I am very protective of Justice League Dark. I'm kind of worried about what... <laughs> what recent news means for Justice League Dark because I am enjoying them a great deal and I would love to see this team have a presence after all of this. Uh, into Actually, to something that you said earlier, ooh, is a change in who, I, who I'm hoping, maybe changing who I'm hoping stick, well, there's two people that from this story that I'm hoping stick around. I know. <laughs> Um, a great, great story here with this team. This team has become really important to me. Where are you at with Justice League Dark uh, as this has been going on? Have they been a, like a forgotten team? Are they a priority team to you? Where Where is this at in your um, your need from DC? Oh, God, I'm digging this, man. And I'll tell you, one of it is I'm loving the story, but I am loving this artwork. This mm-hmm. is absolutely a beautiful book for me. And this is something that I really do enjoy. Now, I'm not saying anything negative about the Justice League artwork, that's also cool. But there is something about just when I flip the page, when I start reading into the Justice League Dark, that it, it does, they do a really good job with just that keeping, it's got to have a little bit different look to it. It's got to have that different groove to it. It's got to fit Justice League Dark. And that's something they've done really well with this story. And again, I love the fact that we're getting... You know, the retelling of the story, how, you know, we had such a dismal appearance, a picture of, you know, um, in the future state with uh, the world of magic. And we're seeing that battle. And in this this time, are the heroes going to be good? Are the heroes going to win? Or is the bad guys going to win? We don't know yet. You know, with a lot of the different future state stuff and, you know, those stories we've seen, the heroes have tried. You know, we saw Batman and Gotham took down, you know, took down the, you know, and, you know, 
you know, in you know, in one, you know, the good guys won. We're seeing in Clark, you know, in Superman, he hasn't completely won yet, but he's not completely out of the game yet. Justice League Dark, it's still one hundred percent up in the air. We don't know how this is going to play out. We don't know how the magic universe is going to fare after everything is said and done. And I think that for me is something I'm very glad that Dark is telling the story and they're taking their time with it. Now, I love the fact that it is in backup on uh, Justice League. For me, that's a great uh, combo. Now, I would read Justice League Dark, a solo series by itself. Yep. No issue. But, you know, the fact that they're putting the two Justice Leagues together, for me, has been, I've actually really enjoyed that. So, I think, you know, I'm, again, yeah, I'm 100% all in on this, just like I've been 100% all in on the Justice League. So, but again, you got to love that each book, each creative team is telling their story. So I'm wondering what happens. So again, you know, what's going to happen to Justice League Dark? You know, especially with this as this story plays out, because we're starting to wrap up getting near the end of it. You know, we're, we're starting to come to the final conclusion of the fate of magic. That's what's in the balance here. And I think that for me is kind of a neat thing because I was never, I never really followed magic superheroes. You know, the, when they had that one Justice League uh, dark team, you know, when they, you know, they've had a couple of different stories. I'm like, oh, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of neat. But it, I, it never really was my jam. You know, I enjoyed the stories and I read them, but I wasn't like that passionate readers. Oh, we got to this and this and that. And then understanding all the world, you know, the weird quirkiness of the magic world. It, it, I don't know. It just didn't click with me. But these stories, I think, because we saw such a dismal outcome that it's really now we're seeing the path. Where is it going to go? How is it going to play? Are the heroes going to win? I think that really built up a anticipation for me. So, you know, the future state stuff really helped me enjoy Justice League Dark, just like it helped me enjoy the Gotham, just like it helped me enjoy the Justice League, all the different stuff where they, you saw this really horrific ending. You know, and you keep in the back of my mind, I keep thinking, okay, the heroes can't win every single story. Somewhere they got to lose. And, and in my head, Justice League Dark is the prime spot where they could lose. But you may you can even lose by – you can win and still lose. You know, you know what I'm saying? And I think the Dark – the Magic Universe, really that's a good place where you can have where the heroes win, but it caught, what's the price? Because, again, in the world, rules of magic, everything has a price. What's going to be the price here to win? Yeah, I also like that this, we've had this huge plan for Merlin that's been on the table. And he has been one chess move ahead every single time. He's manipulated Zatanna. He's brought Arian back on the table, which I didn't see that coming. I mean, it was cool to see that and, and a further link to Aquaman. I loved that being a, a thing that was in play. I didn't see Diana coming on the scene. You know, as as Zatanna, they're trying to reach and tap into Zatanna and and really get to her. I love that the plan all along was not that they were going to reach Zatanna using her father. That was to buy time so Diana could get there and she could be the one yeah. that would reach her. Which I'm so glad because of the fact that we've brought her back to life and we're going to see her now in this moment. I'm, it's, I'm kind of floored. A part of me, you know, as we're as we're taking a look at all this, Diana, it's she just came back. <laughs> I know, I, yeah, it's yeah, like uh, guys, and and again, I love them calling in the big guns, yes, you know, and just you know, you got it, you know, who else could reach, you know, you know, um, who else can reach Satana? Diana can, and yep. I think that for me was a really cool moment because when they when I saw the flash, the, the you know the you know the energy flying through the sky, and I'm like, that's got to be Diana. And then they say until she arrives, like, yep, that's Diana. You know, you know, you knew it was coming, but I still cheered when I saw her. And I think that for me is a really cool story element when you know what the outcome is going to be, but you still cheer for it. You know, and that is something that, you know, this book has really done well because when she was a part of Justice League Dark, that was a really cool energy and vibe she brought to the team. Because, again, she is super cool. And I like, you know, when you get creatives and, you know, in, in you know, the creative teams who understand, you know, Diana's true power isn't just in her strength and speed and just the warrior. It is, you know, her, you know, her heart, her character, her, you know, her compassion, her love, just that, you know, just that awesome energy that she has. 
You know, that's the true strength of Wonder Woman. And again, in one single page, they made sure we, they, we as the reader knew they know that. You know, so again, complete anticipation for what's to happen next with Diana and now in the mix. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really, really a cool team as I'm looking over the whole dynamics of it. I love seeing people like the exploration of Ragman in this, the Dr. Fate. Exp- I'm a big fan of the Dr. Fate concept. This version of Dr. Fate, I've become a big fan of. I'm more, you know, of a Dr. Fate traditionalist. This guy, I'm really starting to dig. And I, I like how using the magic has consequence. And that's one of the things that I think Justice League Dark is doing a little differently. Any use of magic has after effects. There's a darkness to it. Uh, Zatanna's even had a secret that's been on the table that she's been holding something back, and, and her whole team hasn't known about it. Ragman has. John's just discovering it. And it's interesting to see how the team's reacting to it. I love that they're standing behind her. So this this particular arc is concluding next issue. It's going to be interesting to see where this goes from here. Big things happening in in all of Justice League. This is one where I'm so happy to complete this ride. I'm sad to complete this ride because it's been good. And that's the way you should feel at the end of a run is I've really been enjoying this. And whatever they do with this these concepts moving forward, I appreciate that the creative that's been involved in this title has made Justice League a must-read book for me again. Because I've always had, I've, Justice League's always been a book that I've enjoyed reading. It's always been, it, it, but it's fallen in my stack in very di- different places over the years, depending on what the run is doing. Sometimes it feels like a flagship title. Other times it feels just like a really good team book with a bunch of characters who I really enjoy that's put together by really good creative teams. I, that's not a knock. I've got a lot of books that fall in that category where they're good reads. I really enjoy re- reading them every month. The team's delivering. Uh, that's not a knock on them in any way, shape, or form. But they aren't as high up on my stack as some of the must-read titles. And Justice League's been that roller coaster book for me where it never's at the bottom of the stack. But it's it's sometimes fallen to, I guess to use wrestling term, it's fallen to the mid-card <laughs> at certain yeah. times. And it's been a good mid-card book. Um, and in this run, it's been a top-tier run all the way through. And I, I really appreciate both creative teams because I do think it's it's uh, it's an amalgamation of great creative team in the front, great creative team in the back, delivering stories that are amazing. Echo what you said on the art because I think the creep factor of this is really, really important. There is a horror aspect of this story that I really enjoy. And that doesn't work if you don't have this art team with the, with the artistic style and the color tones in this as well. And, and I think it's it's all of it put together um, with dialogue that is just really stunning. This has been a must-read book. Oh, definitely. Now I can get out of here! Our next discussion is on One Star Squadron, issue number two. The writer is Mark Russell with Steve Lieber on art, Dave Stewart colorist, Dave Sharp on letterers, uh, Steve Lieber and Dave Stewart on the cover. Uh, Chris Rosa is the associate editor, Brittany Holzer is editor, and Mike Cotton is senior editor. So, One Star Squadron, this was an interesting one. I, I, I heard a couple of good things on the net. I might have been Peter Rios. Peter, I follow Peter on uh, Twitter and Instagram, and he will every so often post, you know, blurbs about books that he's been reading. I, I want to say that he he said something um, good about this or mentioned this book, and it threw it back on my radar again. Uh, I'm a big fan of All Star Squadron and classic books like that. So when I the title cooked me, and the idea of it being a six issue series, and you get to see Red Tornado on the cover and just get some ideas on what this could be, I walked in not knowing what the premise was. The idea that this is uh, like a an app. And an organization that is geared towards some of our heroes that, speaking of mid-card, some of our, <laughs> some of our heroes that maybe haven't quite made it to the mid-card, which is interesting. You and I are big wrestling fans, right? And there's been a lot of wrestling releases lately of just really talented wrestlers who I keep wondering where are they going to wind up? You know, what promotion are they going to wind up with? Because I want to follow them and, and see their work. These heroes are, some of these heroes are falling in that category. 
Now it's interesting in this. There's some there's some controversial usage of characters in this. And I like this story a lot. There's one character in particular with that I'm not comfortable with her characterization. <laughs> and that's Power Girl. Um, and I'm yeah. not I'm not knocking the story. I'm enjoying the story. But if you were to ask me right now, like, how are you feeling about it? I want to ride this whole journey out because I'm I'm enjoying the story a great deal. I like what they're doing with Red Tornado in particular. He's my riding buddy. So if you ask me who you're following right now, Red Tornado. Uh, he's got a lot going on with him right now in this story, and he's easy to follow. But it's his his nemesis seems to be Power Girl right now. I want to know what's going on. I'm hoping something's going on with her. There's going to be some kind of swerve coming, or you know, we're going to find out she's being manipulated or something. Because if there's one thing that I'm strangely uncomfortable with right now, it's it's the portrayal of Power Girl in this, uh, which again. Let me ride out the journey. I may feel very different by the end of this story. I like the book, but that would be my one caveat. I'm not so comfortable with the handling of Power Girl in this. Um, that, I want to see where this story goes with it. My opinion on Power Girl is mind control. As soon as she started talking about reading Max Lord's book, yeah, I'm like, she was mind controlled. Sure. You know, because anytime he, his name is mentioned, that always pops in my head. And just looking at you, everything you said about how you're uncomfortable with her her portrayal and all that stuff, I'm like, it's got to be a mind control. You know, and, and again, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I, and I don't know. But that is what I'm thinking it is, because just the general concept of this, that you've got the, you know, the, the, the B and C players, you know, are actually in this. And even they joke around about how they're called the one star squadron because out of a five star rating, they get ones. You know, I, I like that notion of it. And, you know, you've got those heroes and this, this story they're telling is a really cool story. And just everything you said about Power Girl made me go, what? Wait a minute, hold on. You know, then you, it just kind of, you know, she threw me for a loop. And that's why I was thinking, you know, again, as I said, and just like the, you know, when they showed the board of directors, mm -hmm. I, I didn't recognize any of them, but they had a super villain look to them. You know? yes. and I'm like, I, I think they're bad guys. And maybe that's where the mind control is coming from. Maybe that's where the manipulation is happening. I, I, again, it's one of those things I don't know exactly what's playing out, but I do dig the story. I do too. You know, and it's one of that's something that I was like, man, this notion of these other heroes because you know we we've joked around multiple times about if we ever got superpowers, the kind of superhero we'd be. This right here is where we would. Be. <laughs> Let's be completely honest, man. We'd be on one star squadron going to birthday parties. You know, dude. <laughs> hey, no, kids, no, 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 rich man, dude. Here's the thing we've learned from this one: you don't want to be Minute Man. You want to be Brock Kensington. <laughs> <laughs> Big time, big yeah. time. <laughs> I, I, and I want to I, actually. You're framing this up really well. I want to clarify. I'm enjoying the story. I don't know that, and that to the point of what you're saying right now. I don't know that my discomfort of Power Girl isn't what I'm exactly what I'm supposed to be feeling. Like I think we're. I think there's things to your point that are going on here that we're supposed to be like. What are they doing? That's why I. I always want to finish out the story before I fully judge it. On that end, I don't like Power Girl in it right now. I don't like her, her portrayal and what's going on. But what they've done really well is I'm focused on Red Tornado. I'm focused on what he's doing and how he's... I think what we're supposed to be doing is all in on Red Tornado, yeah. who is trying to do his best in an environment where we're seeing a lot of characters that in recent years, since you and I have been doing this podcast are characters that kind of vanished. <laughs> you know, Black Condor, characters like that are, are back on the scene again. And it's great to see these characters, like, going, oh, well, I used to be a thing, and now yeah. I'm doing, you know, what a lot of people are to make money online. And I think it's great that they're referencing what is a very real-world situation that people are able to take, and they should be able to take their popularity, monetize it, to make ends meet while they're trying to find the next big thing to get themselves situated. And I'm glad that there's that effort. Uh, I, I reference wrestling right now uh, for a, a singular reason that a lot of my favorite wrestlers are doing this right now where they're 
you know, monetizing themselves through Cameo, through their own uh, personal fan sites, through Twitch streams. Um, they're they're trying to generate that while I think they're planning out, either waiting out uh, no-compete clauses or uh, planning out what promotions they want to pitch to, you know, deciding what the next step is for themselves. And I think it's very timely to be reading this with superheroes because I think that's a thing. And I'm glad to see they're talking about the challenges of this, too. That sometimes you have to make decisions on, do I want to go to this birthday party? Another birthday party. This isn't what I'm trying to do. I, I can imagine that being a challenge for anybody, take take wrestling out of it, anybody that's in celebrity status, who is trying to build their brand towards the next level thing that they're going to do, trying to find the balance of, I need money right now, and I want to be gainfully employed with consistency, but I don't want to start heading myself down a rabbit hole where now I'm doing these things that are taking me further and further away from my end goal of where I want to be again, and I start getting known as being the person that does this stuff instead of the thing that I originally did. I think there's a reality of that exploration in this that I'm like, I didn't see this being where this was going at all. Uh, And Red Tornado trying to help these people out in this process. Uh, I totally get it. Like last issue with uh, Gangbuster. Yes. I thought that was a powerful one because, you know, this is an average everyday guy who took one too many shots to the head. Yep. He's got the concussion syndrome stuff going on. And that's uh, that was something I was like, Oh wow, that is huge! And then even when they go, you know, Red Tornado finds this house, and like, oh no, we just moved here. You know, we have no. And then they, you go in and you see that actually was his family. You know, and they <laughs> don't want him around because of those rage issues, because of all that stuff that happened, and all that was again because he was a hero, because he tried to take down the bad guys, because he took one too many shots to the head. I think that for me, that was another really just powerful stuff going on. And it's, you know, that is the thing that's the surprise on this story. If you look at just the big overall picture, it is kind of funny that you see the B and C heroes, but they really have these true ramifications going on in their lives. And you feel bad for these guys, you know, and, you know, male and female character, you know, you feel bad for them because, you know, it's, you know, you're a hero. You want to help people. You want to do the right thing, but not everybody's a billionaire. Not everybody is a journalist. Not everybody, you know, owns a multi-billion dollar tech company. It's, you know, you've got to have, you've got the everyday person on the job as well. And I like seeing that. And I, I, this is a story that I'm, it's cool that we got a six issue run and, you know, that means we're going to get a nice beginning, middle and end. But I do want to see ongoing. I would love to see more of this kind of stuff with other unknown characters, you know, of them dealing with the day to day life. So I think that'd be a very interesting uh, comic book title where we see outside of the costume. I love Minute Man, like at the birthday party. Because <laughs> I get it. And I, I mean, it's it's one of those things where he's trying to make the best of it. And he's like, you know what? I know it's going to get these kids. I met Superman. I love the picture of Superman where Superman's even got this weird look in the selfie. And the yeah. kids are like, how much did that picture cost you? <laughs> it's so great. And then he's like, dude, you know, to the dad, listen, hey, when do you want me to showcase the powers? Because, like, we got a minute and it's, I want to make that minute pay off for you. And the guy's like, wait, Minute Man? I thought it was just your name. No, no, dude, it's in my rider, it's in my powers, you know, that's kind of it. We got a minute. I mean, so you get why, like, this dude, we're going to take him on a mission. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's a a tough thing. And again, you know, I do love, I I agree with you on uh, just that look on Clark's face. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, I I also, this page cracked me up because I love how he's like, it's highlighted. You don't even have to be a strong reader. This guy, I I feel so bad for him. Because even earlier, when he's in the drug deal, and he's like, and that guy's like three hundred bills, he's like, what? I only paid fifty. The pharmacy he's like, I know you're new to this stuff, but drug deals are supposed to be quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's really, really interesting as we take a look at this whole scenario uh, to see, like, for example, his powers are not inward out; they're they're drug based. So when he got the wrong drugs. 
it led to him being beat up by hammers by these kids <laughs> who, you know, he was like, I've got invulnerability. Everyone take a hammer and throw it at him. And, you know, he knows he's got time. It's 13 seconds, which means he's got time. He is getting pummeled and hurt. And he's like, wait a minute, this is not how it's supposed to play. You know, the dad, like, I mean, talk about an embarrassing thing. This is killer to his career as a superhero in, in the work with Red Tornado. Because his reviews are going to be terrible. It's bad for the company. It, I mean, when you think about this concept, it's one of the things I love about the reality of this story. He is not good for business. And, I, you know, not only did he almost die, which is a thing, but he's using the same drug that our man uses. But for him, it only works for a minute. One minute. <laughs> if it's the right stuff. And, and I find that completely and utterly fascinating. The Lex Luthor bit was pretty cool. Yeah. Again, this was one of the neat things about this. And I like how that the villains have their own app as well. <laughs> but, yeah. hey, you guys only take 5%? Oh, that's cool. You get a better pay rate. And, you know, and I love the notion. They're like, yeah, it's about the same thing, whether you're a hero or a villain. We're all just for hire. It's henchmen, you know? And I, I thought that, again, a really neat concept of both whether you're a hero or a villain. And I did air quotes around those words. It's the same kind of deal. And I love when he's sitting there, like the villain's even saying, Sportsmaster's saying, hey, listen, yeah, it's not bad, actually. And and the guy's like, she's 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 basically come back and going, hey, I'm pretty sure that app's just for villains. Yeah, but at this point, is it really any different? When you think about the kind of work that they're doing, it's kind of your mercenaries for hire. <laughs> he's asking a great thing. I think it's awesome. Now, the one thing I do wonder is, why is Plastic Man here? Because Plastic Man is a Justice League member. Not right now. But he has been, so he has actual real powers, and well, but and even like Fire Firehawk, she's got real powers, and these are people who could actually be on a team and could do something. But they aren't. It actually goes back to the wrestler analogy I was telling you about, where you know these are people. Yes, they should be. So there's a lot of wrestlers that have been released recently. Let's use them as an example, right? Top tier talent, quality talent that it's of no fault of theirs. It was the company just couldn't, which is, some of it's baffling because you you know what I'm talking about. There's yeah. people. Here's the thing: you, you're you're a big fan of AEW right now. I am too. You haven't been watching a lot of the WWE product though lately. I've been watching all of it. Both companies have the same problem, and it's it's a common thing in wrestling where there's talent that we as fans can see where we're like, that is a mega star. The booking's horrible for them, and let's be honest about that. It's just they can't get it together where. Um, whether it's the fault of the talents, the fault of the booking team, a little bit A, a little bit of B, um, or just circumstantial. Sometimes they tried a storyline that just went wrong, that was really nobody's fault, but it didn't engage the fans the way they thought it was going to, and then they didn't have a follow-up plan. They didn't adapt and evolve for that particular person. In the case of this, this is a great example of that. I mean, they released... Let's use two from WWE as an example that they released from NXT. They released Karrion Cross and Keith Lee. Those are two, and I'm not, there's a lot of other people. I could go down a whole rabbit hole with this of just incredible talent. These are two top stars that I just think are, like, how do you get them wrong is more <laughs> of what yeah. I'm saying. They aren't right now, they're not signed as far as I know, and apologies. They're not signed with a major promotion right now. These are both guys that are starting to make plans for appearances again or starting or just starting to make appearances again that to me should be at a top tier company should be in the main event picture they were moved from NXT to the main roster in WWE and they screwed them up uh, just totally ruined their gimmicks made them unrecognizable like it was like they were like this is working let's ruin it <laughs> and it really was as simple as that. They moved to the main roster and completely, it was like they didn't understand them at all. So you've got that with with superheroes, right? Where you've got these characters that were thriving on team books or were thriving in solo books or were very interesting as backup characters or team you know, dynamics. These two that you're referencing are examples of two characters that have been in major runs, one in Firestorm, one in uh, Justice League. Plastic Man, my gosh, in his own miniseries. 
Yeah. You know, from a, a series of miniseries, I should say, that were incredible. But they are ideal people that would wind up in this type of situation where you're like, oh, there's no work right now. I was on this team. Now what do I do? i got to make ends meet. Uh, and it, it's got to be hard for Plastic Man to get a day job. <laughs> <laughs> because he's he's him. You know, he can't just... Being an accountant. Because <laughs> he has, we know he has trouble keeping it together. And I'm not sure Firehawk, I'm forgetting if she can turn that off. I think she can. If I remember, oh boy, I'm drawing a blank right now. But it, again, you know, these are people who they want to be out. They want to be doing their job. And I think the idea behind this app is hoping this app will lead them back to superhero work. They're not trying to be stuck doing these kind of parties or these kind of missions or things like that. The idea is, how can I get connected with the right situation to get myself back in the game? Ideally, you want to be on a Justice League that's being funded by Oliver Queen. <laughs> exactly. You want that. Because there's or... money there, you know? Uh, there's, Which is an interesting sort of piece. There's a reality to this yeah. that I think is... I don't remember them exploring this in recent years like this where it's so contemporary. They've done stuff like this before, um, where they've explored this kind of thing, but not this with an app, with this contemporary of an approach, at least at DC. I love the the whole convention with our autograph alley, where you've got the comic writer sitting next to Minuteman. I love that the writer snuck into the VIP room, but made it seem like he was a VIP. Exactly. uh, that whole bit at the end where he is getting escorted out and the guy who played him in the movie is a VIP in the room. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be, I want to say it again, you want to be less minute, man. You want to be more Brock Kensington because Brock Kensington has it figured out. <laughs> yep. I'll tell you, you want to know something neat that I noticed again on my art read through? You know how, again, you said it was Mark Russell was sitting next to him, and he did Uh sneak in and sneak out. If you look at the color of his badge, you'll see he's got a green badge, which is not the the, the, the reddish, pinkish badge, whatever, is the VIP badge. I thought that, for me, was a really neat touch. That again, that was I didn't notice that until you know my art read through when I actually sat down and I was looking and all that stuff. But again, stuff like this cracked me up because this whole you know, the artist alley, the photograph alley and all that, you know, and we've seen, you know, at the different conventions we've gone to, we've seen stuff like this where you get the people who, you know, whose line is, you know, all the way back and just high demand. And then you get some people who aren't as high demand. And, you know, sometimes I feel bad for those people. Sometimes I don't. It's, it's one of those really neat things that I'm glad this is something they brought into it because you you think back to, how many times have we gone to a con where there is that actor who was in an 80s sitcom? Mm-hmm. You know, they, they did that one big thing and that was it. And we see them at the con. And we're like, they have absolutely nothing to do with comic books. What are they doing here is what I always used to think. And then I realized, you know, the, the convention circuit and all. And once I learned all the stuff going on, you know, I'm like, oh, OK, so, of course, we got it tied into here. So that, again. This is absolutely wonderful stuff, man. I'm loving this book because of this, but I feel horrible for this guy. I want I want Minuteman to be okay. <laughs> yeah, what I'm finding more and more now is it's you're right. I've evolved in my thinking. Um, I love going to conventions that have a wide variety of people, from classic shows straight on through to comics. I think the piece that I have been disappointed in is not the rise in celebrities from throughout history being there because I enjoy seeing them. I really do. You know, if I grew up with a show that I really enjoyed in in my childhood straight on through and there's an opportunity to meet those people and thank them for the fact that, you know, and get a picture or, you know, an autograph or something like that because they entertained me over the years, I want to do that. And and I I feel that there's a good synergy between them and fans. And I'd like I like going to more than anything else, the panels. And being able to hear the stories, the behind the scenes stuff. And I really appreciate that they come out and do that. But equally important to me and what brought me to the dance was comic writers, comic artists, being able to see them and hear the behind the scenes stories and, you know, hear where their career is going, catching books that I've missed or knowing stuff that's on the table, like what company are they working for now? If they're no longer with a DC or a Marvel, what company are you working for? Did you publish a novel? 
you know, um, Fabian Nicieza just published a novel recently, and I, I love his work. And I didn't know it. I just caught it on Facebook recently. You know, it's little things like that that give me the opportunity to catch that, okay, this writer who I've really enjoyed has now published a book, and, and I would like to read that book. So I bought it, and I've got it on my Kindle. So, I mean, these are things that I find a lot of value of in conventions. And I, f I found that as the celebrity piece has overtaken a lot of conventions, the comic piece is less and less prevalent there. And that's a problem. I want to see an equal balance of comic book writers, artists. And I think it's an important connection that fans need. This year is a really tough year to use as an example because of COVID. You know, as we start to evolve and, and COVID starts to normalize, because this isn't go, supposed to go away, it's supposed to become an endemic and, you know, COVID's going to be like the new flu. And I'm please know I'm not making light on that or making some kind of political statement about COVID right now. What I'm trying to say is wherever COVID goes, when we eventually get to whatever the new normal is going to be, and I think we're gradually getting there. I'm hoping we start to see conventions resurface again because we've seen, we lost wizard conventions. I'm hoping we see an increase in conventions again that are opportunities for us to see creators and talent from all media. Because uh, I think that's, my favorite conventions are the ones where it's like, oh, I can be in, immersed in all of this. Because um, that in-person, I like this online stuff just fine. I hope that continues because I'm not going to be able to go to every convention. But the increase in online content is not keeping me from wanting to physically be there. I want to be there. I want to meet these people. I want to get an autograph signature that's personal to the fact that I was there with them. I want the picture with them. I want to be in that picture. Uh, I don't, you know, that type of stuff is really important to me. When I see this, I'm like, this is such a geek out because. I feel so bad about the fact that in some cases it's very hard for people to maybe get connected with the right convention that is going to connect them with the fans that are looking for them. Uh, you and I have both been at conventions before. We've seen people with lines out the door and other people that are you know, patiently waiting for somebody to come by and start talking to them. I think... All of those people, whether you're the big name or the person that is striving to get the word out about your content, uh, they're all important to the convention experience for me. They've, they've got to be there. And this is, I was so relating to this story <laughs> yep. in such a crazy way that I didn't expect that you've got this story where behind the scenes, Red Tornado's trying to run this company where he genuinely cares about these people. He's genuinely trying to guide them, be a mentor. Kind of what he was doing in Young Justice. Like with Minuteman, he's trying to make him successful in this realm, right? And in doing that, he isn't noticing that behind the scenes, Power Girl's leading a coup against him <laughs> <laughs> with the board of directors. Which does fit what we saw in her solo title, meaning that she is, she does have a corporate background. She would have the ability to do this, but it doesn't match her character at all. I can't wait to see where this goes. I really, Mark Russell's really delivering a great story here. I'm enjoying the story a great deal. I don't, I want to punch Power Girl right now. Right. Um, but I. But you're supposed to. And I think, I think so too. Right I there. do think the so. The way she's being written, you're having the exact reaction you're supposed to. Yeah. I think that for me is a quality. Again, it's like that's one of the th things I like about this writing that yes. there's no one. I disagree with who she is and what she's doing. Yeah. But there's nobody here that I'm like, you know, that I'm like, oh, that's just bad writing. It's not bad writing. It's good writing. It's just. I wish she was different, you know, and that's why I keep thinking that there's some type of mind control thing going on. There's sometimes stories that make you uncomfortable that I think you're not supposed to feel uncomfortable with. And that's a failure in the story. I don't think this is one of those. I think you're supposed to. <laughs> right. I think you're nailing it. And I think we're seeing the same thing here, which is why I'm very intrigued by this. This is an intriguing story. And uh, we've got four more issues of it, and I'm glad. I'm glad this is a six-issue series because I feel like this is just getting warmed up, and I need the other four issues to, at the end, really put a judgment on this. But I'll tell you, issue three comes out. I'm jumping to it. Oh, I mean, time. this is on my – if there's one success off of this, um, I read issue one and two together just because I was intrigued by it. 
I, issue three, I'm going to read right when it's out. <laughs> I want to know more. Good, good read. Great molecules. They're programming the computers for a chain reaction to blow up that atomic pile. I'd like to remind everyone about our show voicemail line. It's one 388 4434 or Dr. Norge on Skype. We love having you part of the show. Ragingbullets at gmail.com is our email address. If you do leave us a message through Skype, just remember that I can't leave a message that says, you know, welcome to Raging Bullets, please leave us a message. It is us, so if you get that message saying that this user is not available, please leave us a message. I had a couple listeners that actually asked about that the other day. That is, in fact, our show voicemail line. RagingBullets.com is our show website. That's where you're going to find out new episode updates. It does feed into our Facebook fan page and our Twitter. We also are proud to be part of a Facebook group community that really actually fed one of our segments today. So I want to thank everyone there for posting articles and links to discussion topics that are on their mind, things that they notice that they want to share with the group. I go there to just browse and pick up things that uh, people are finding interesting, both in and out of DC Comics. Uh, If you have a blog or if you have a podcast or anything that you really want to share that's relevant, feel free to throw it out there. I feel that we're part of a community. We have people who shout us out all the time. We certainly want to be able to do the same for anyone else. So we're very collaborative that way. Please don't hesitate to use our uh, social media avenues for that as well. The About Us section of our show website is how you're going to find out to get a hold of us through gaming platforms and social media as well if you want to connect with us individually. We're sponsored, as always, by DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Jim, what's going on over at DCBService.com? We have the Phantom Stranger Omnibus Hardcover, 50% off, only $62.50. And we have War for Earth 3, Issues 1 and 2, 40% off, only $4.19. Thank you, DCBS. Over at InStockTrades.com. That's where you're going to find the deals of the week, like Batman White Knight Presents Harley Quinn Hardcover, $24.99 regularly, 42% off, only $14.49. The Amazing World of Superman, Tabloid Edition, $19.99 regularly, 65% off, only $6.99. Batman Hardcover Book 12, City of Bane Part 1, $24.99 regularly, 65% off, only $8.74. There's a ton of deals like this. Please check out the deals a week over at InStockTrades.com. I want to thank both companies for continuing to support our show. Mr. Seglin, our next episode, we're going to be back and we're going to talk about Batgirls and the new creative team on Catwoman. We will see you then. Bye. All right, you guys. Are you ready to sing your song? I sure we are. Yeah, let's sing it now. Okay, this should be fun. Now get ready for your cue. Okay, Sean? Okay. Okay, Jim? Jim? Let's get ready. That was very good, Sean. Naturally. Uh, Jim, you're a little flat there, so be careful. Jim. Jim. Jim!
Excellent job, guys. Let's sing it again. Yeah, let's sing it again. No, no, that's enough. Let's not push it. Push it? What is that? Yeah, what are you talking about? No, I don't. I didn't what mean to buy that. I think Sean, you're going to hear my song. Sean, Jim. I don't know. How long do you want the song to go? Look, it's all pretty.